and welcome to a very special segment of Silent Voices. I'm Dr. Carol Kramer, and this is a very special segment for me because of my interest in the local judges and the local Department of Human Services, also known as Child Protective Services, of Kent County. The reason it's important to me is that I have worked in Kent County as a classroom teacher, as a school social worker, and as a therapist in private practice. And it was while I was a therapist in private practice that I became more and more aware of the activities of the Department of Human Services, also known as Child Protective Services. Now, there's usually, if you're a therapist watching, there's usually one or two cases that haunt you for many years. And the case that has haunted me for many years is the case that I'm going to introduce to you uh, this evening, or this morning, as the case may be when you're watching this. And the woman with whom I got to work and was in counseling with, her name is Sharon. And Sharon is here to share her story with you about what went on with her family as she was working with and involved with the Department of Human Services. I'm going to ask her to kind of start from the beginning so that you will know what happened. So Sharon, I'm introducing you and I'd like to say to you, um, I'm, I'm welcoming you and would you share with the audience what went on? I remember the first time you came into my office and it seemed to me that you, be, you came into my office because you were dealing with a blended family. Yes, Carol. Um, I had remarried and had um, three older children and um, married a man that um, turned out to be abusive to my two older children, um, quite abusive. Uh, and then I did a call to get help and found you. Um, this man, um, at one time with my daughter, um, had shoved her into a swamp numerous times for just being dis disrespectful, I believe. So many times that my daughter thought she was going to drown. Uh, this was reported to the police. This was reported to Child Protective Services. He also at one time pulled her by her hair down some cement steps because she would not leave the friend's home that she had run to because she did not want to come back to the home with this man that I had married. How old was she at that time, Sharon? I believe she was 10 years old. Okay. And he also was abusive to her older brother. Um, actually, um, smashing a mirror on his car at one time, cutting his hand, um, having to take him, uh, pull him off. My son, uh, Gabe, who was 13 at the time, had him in a chokehold for what he thought because he was disrespectful to me at the time. Were any of these cases, any of these happenings ever reported to either Protective Services or to the police? Yes, uh, reports, reports were made to the police department and DHS. Um, DHS came out to the home on two different occasions. It seems as if there wasn't much more time that passed and there was a special reason uh, that you came in, and you came in with your two youngest daughters and your son, your youngest son, and they had something to tell me. But I think it's important for the listeners to know a little bit of the history of what had happened. It seemed that you had gone down to a Bible conference in Indiana with your teenage daughter, and you had just returned home from the weekend. And would you explain to the audience a little bit more about what had transpired at that time? Yes. It was a um, Monday afternoon where we had been shopping for my daughter Nicole's birthday. And um, I was back in the kitchen with the kids and getting dinner ready. It was around 4 p.m. And Abby had an accident, had wet her pants, and she had been potty trained for weeks. I took her into the bathroom and she had disclosed to me 
that um, dad had opened it and that he had had a knife when I tried to get her to take the wet clothes off to bathe her and put her in the tub. Um, I immediately got on the phone with a pediatrician and uh, told her what Abby had just told me and that um, we had been gone for the weekend and the, ki the kids were with dad the whole weekend. Uh, from that point on I went to the emergency room at St. Mary's and uh, they were going to examine Abby and uh, said that they could do that there or I could take her to the child assess Children's Assessment Center. Um, I opted to go to the Children's Assessment Center so that she would not have to go through two examinations um, traumatizing her at her age. Uh, so we left St. Mary's Emergency Room. My daughter Nicole and uh, Abigail and Amelia met with Dr. Cox. It was in the evening. We were the only ones in the facility. He examined both girls, Amelia first. Uh, he ex examined Abby and as he examined her vaginal area, found a vaginal lesion from top to bottom. Um, he said that she had been cut in the last 48 hours, that it would have bled, bled profusely, that it would have been extremely painful, and that it would have bled for a long time. Abby also disclosed to this Dr. Cox, as she did to myself at home, the exact same thing, that dad opened it and that dad had a knife. They did take pictures of the lacerations. We were told to go home and to wait for Child Protective Services to call us. There were no calls made to police department or any other calls made that I was aware of. So, so you are telling me that there were never any calls made. The police never came out. Now, just a minute. How old was Abby at that time? Abby was three. Three years old. Yes. Sounds like she was pretty articulate. Very. And so what happened next after that? Who contacted the police? Were they ever contacted? No, no, the, people, the police were not contacted. In fact, I, I went home Monday and I had to call Child Protective Services Thursday because I had not heard from anybody. Um, and then I was, the following Monday that they showed up at the home and I showed the mattress where the blood was, where you could visibly see the blood on the mattress, where it had been wiped off. Um, DHS just kind of glanced at it, turned and walked out of the room, spent a couple of minutes walking through my home, um, did not talk to the children at the time, and left. Where was your husband at this time? He was on the road. He was on the road um, Monday through Friday and then home on the weekends. So it was, it seems to me that it was shortly after this time that you brought the children in and I remember them getting up on the chairs in my office. We sat at a round table and each one of them telling me what had gone on. Yes. And I remembered thinking that wow, I better send a report in and call DHS because they were disclosing this. Um, I'm going to think that perhaps your pediatrician did that too. And we do know from all our documentation, your documentation in particular, that these notes were written about the contacts and about the sexual abuse into the notes of the pediatricians. Now, when you had all this evidence, again, was there any connection? Was there ever any police or sheriff's department that came out? And if they did, how did they come out? No, they never came out to the, out to the home. In fact, I had to contact them um, probably a week or two weeks after I met the, your DHS came out to the home. I went to the police department myself. I was given the name of a gentleman that I was to meet and speak with. I did go and speak with him shared him the experience of what Abby had told me and at that time I also had more information that Amelia had walked into the room after the incident and stated daddy was naked and that dad ye yelled at her and that dad spanked her and told her she had to leave the room. Uh, she told me that she hid in a closet and then she got scared and went and got her older brother Adam. Well Adam wouldn't come the first time so she went back into the closet again 
went and got Adam a second time, Adam did come in the second time. And so they all witnessed the after facts of this, this experience. Yes, you know, I remember that. And I, I remember in particular asking Adam, because I had taught school, and I think he was maybe in the third or fourth grade then, and I had taught those grades. So I remembered asking him if he would draw me a picture of exactly what he saw happening. And he did draw a picture of it exactly as the children had all described it. And then I, I of course, called in. First I'd called in for the girls, and then I called in before I sent in the uh, 3200 uh, to Adam, or of Adam's drawing and about him, because uh, that was the usual procedure prior to when I was a school social worker. So I did that. And it was amazing to me what CPS said, or DHS. They said to me, the receptionist, no, we have enough information. Please uh, don't send in any more. I said, but your report says, your 3200 report form says, if there is new information, and this is new, he has drawn a picture, and he has talked about being uh, sexually abused also by his, father, by his stepfather. And she refused to uh, have me or, or tell me to send it in, so I asked to talk to her supervisor. And I remember the supervisor got very angry and said, no, we have enough information. Do not send in any more information. And I said, look, I'm required by law. I'm sending it in. Do what you will. And I remember sending it in. And I remember how angry and upset they seemed to be. And that seemed very foreign to me, why they had not been supportive of you and how they had uh, not been supportive of me. And I was wondering if you have any more input on that. What happened? Didn't they come afterwards oh. and take the children? Yes. In fact, one of the reasons why they removed the children from my home is because there were 15 3200s reports of the abuse from my children, for my children. They stated that they all came from me and that I was the one that instigated the doctors and yourself to submit these reports on my behalf. So it was like it was all my doing. Um, yeah, they came out to the home and uh, two sheriffs followed Adam home from school and uh, forced themselves into the home. No warrants, no paperwork. Just because they had a call to pick up the children, I was shoved against the wall by one sheriff and the other got the kids ready and had them get their favorite, favorite animals, blankets, what have you, and um, told the children they would be gone for only 24 hours and they would be back home with mom the next day. Um, all I heard was they got a call. So I took, fought, took the children out to the car. Um, horrible experience. Um, eight years ago, eight years out of my life. That's how long since that time. It seems to me that it continued to be an abusive situation. And at one point, when I tried to find out why they took the children from you, they, the Department of Social Services said in their notes that they had removed the children because you had told them that their dad was not a nice person. However, that you denied it, and I believed you for a very special reason because the social worker from the Children's Assessment Center had sent me, released a copy of her notes to me, and it was in her notes that she was the one, and she writes it right out in her notes, that she had said that, her, that their daddy was not a nice person and could not be trusted. And it was cer certainly some time after that that the children, uh, weren't you listed on some kind of a list or something? I was on the central reg registry twice. And uh, with the attorney uh, that represented me to, for the evidentiary hearing to have my name removed, they expunged my name twice from the central registry without a hearing because they could not come up with any proof of neglect or abuse in any way, shape, or form. It seems that in between all of this, 
I got a call from you one day that all of a sudden they were going to have a hearing at uh, Juvenile Center and it was going to be about the children and you were kind of desperate and you said please come and I just took off uh, from my office and headed on over, put everything on hold and lo and behold to find that you were given some kind of a uh, uh, attorney there that was given by the court, a court appointed one, and it was interesting because your oldest son, uh, Gabe, who was I believe in college at the time, he wanted to talk. They said no, they would not let him talk. I asked if I could. The attorney that was representing you was very unwilling but finally agreed. We got in that courtroom and I asked where the uh, court stenographer was. They didn't have one. It was a magistrate. I asked for some kind of a recording of it. Finally, the, adju the judge said that he would maybe give um, just a written, a written summary of what happened. And we agreed to that. And I remember that your attorney never questioned me and spoke on your behalf or toward me at all. He did absolutely nothing. Whereas your ex-husband, or about to be ex-husband, um, apparently had a very um, well-paid attorney and that your husband sat with the people, and if I remember correctly, his mother, uh, with the people from the Department of Social Services and they were all talking and laughing together. And I'll never forget the report that I got back from that hearing that they were going to disqualify uh, what I said the magistrate was going to disqualify it because, if I remember correctly, I had made too much use of the term absolutely. And when they had asked me if you were a good mother, I said absolutely. And did you show you were a loving mother? And I said absolutely. And apparently they didn't like that. And so he eliminated whatever testimony I had. Now this goes on, and I just want to say one thing here, that um, after I semi-retired, I was able to take the time under freedom of information to see once how these people were qualified because people like that that I was dealing with from the Department of Social Services did not seem to have the qualifications. They couldn't talk in the same language I was talking about the same kind of dynamics. So I got that list. And as a clinical um, social worker licensed by the state of Michigan, as I'm licensed as a teacher and as a marriage and family counselor, I got a group together. We got all these names from the Freedom of Information. And you're going to see something interesting here. Um, they were not. I was looking for people that were licensed clinical social workers because these people were doing all the skills of licensed clinical social workers. And I don't have to hold it the right way up. Upside down, you'll see page after page red with a few yellow lines, or pink. With a, yeah, every pink line is a person that had absolutely no credentials whatsoever, no training, all over the state of Michigan, page after page after page. What did I come up with? And uh, this for the whole Department of Social Services. And um, I came up with some very interesting uh, statistics. And um, I'm just paging through here. Here's what I found out. Um, the Michigan, the county directors, there were 116. 16 of them had a license. 100 were unlicensed. The supervisors for the DHS, at that time in 2004, there were 615 supervisors. 75 of them had a license. 540 were absolutely unlicensed and were doing what they were not supposed to be doing, in my opinion. This is all my opinion as clinical social workers. And then there was the Michigan regular caseworkers for DHS. 5,393 caseworkers were going, doing things with families. 445 of those had a license, but 4,948 were unlicensed caseworkers. Now that was our experience with the DHS, and then we had some experience with the judge. I um, you went into court, and I believe I did not know the judge at all. You had asked me to send a letter to her. 
which I had written standard letters for 18, 20 years and worked with all the judges from the, from the department of, um, of uh, I think it was the 17th district, district court. And I had worked with them and had met with them, never had any problem writing letters. And suddenly, so the only contact I had with this judge was a written professional letter. And I was amazed. You went to saw, see her with your attorney and you came back in and why don't you tell the audience what you told me? What the attorney for the other party, Ron's attorney said, comment that he made in the hall to my attorney, Mary Benedict, that who the hell do you think you were? You were going to save all of God's children by submitting this letter to the judge. And uh, the letter did get submitted, but Today, you cannot find a copy of you, more than one letter that you did write, Carol. You will not find either letter in court records in our file as they are submitted to the judge become part of my file. You will not find your letters there. Wasn't it also true that you said to me, I can't believe what she said. She said, Carol, that you had no credibility with her. Yes. I said, that can't be, Sharon. Yes. Yes. I've never met her. I've never talked with her. I have never had any interaction. I don't know what she looks like. How could I have no credibility with her? And uh, to this day, I had never had the opportunity of meeting that lady. And so it seems that right from the beginning that uh, I felt very uncomfortable with her as your judge in this case. And... Um, I'd like to know if you have any other thoughts. I know our time is shortening up here, and so I'd like to know any other thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with the audience before we wind up. Um, yes, seven years later, uh, with the Honorable Patricia Gardner. I have not seen my daughters in three years. My son, who turned 18, Adam, uh, has been home with me now for two weeks. He uh, did remove himself from abusive father at the age of 17. I was told that he lived as a homeless child uh, his sophomore year and junior year before he moved out. Um, he has signed disclosure to share his story about his experience with the placement by um, the Patricia Gardner putting him with a father who had signed off parental rights and said that he wanted nothing to do with the child when the child was six months old. Wow, that's quite a story. And I'm sure that there are other people out there that can identify with many of these happenings. And um, it's very interesting that your children have repeatedly tried to contact you. What contact you have had from, with them, they have said that they loved you, they wanted to see you, they missed you. There's nothing against you. Uh, why you can't see them, and yet uh, I understand is it the judge that keeps running some interference so you can't see your own children? Yes, I have abided by all her um, requests for psychiatric help with yourself, Carol. Mm -hmm. Supervised visits at Bethany Christian Services for four years. Uh, after they said there was no need for supervised visits, I went back to Patricia Gardner. She still, three years later, is refusing any contact for me to have with my daughters. My name has been expunged from the Central Registry 2004. You There's know. no reason, no, I mean, no proof, no evidence of abuse or not neglect, but I cannot have my daughters in my life. And we have continued this whole time, as you know, Sharon. We have all our documentation. We have everything that we need. But, you know, part of it means that we need an attorney that, to go forward with this. And having said that, I'd like to take a few minutes to thank our viewers. If any of you have any comments uh, or questions that I would like uh, for you to... Um, right into this program. And I want to thank all of you for watching, and we're hoping that we might have another second segment where Sharon might be able to have her son join and share with you his experiences of being put with a father who had never seen him his entire life at age eight or nine. 
It was a very devastating experience. He just saw me personally lately to tell me about some of it. So thank you all for watching, and we want to thank the producer of Silent Voices and everyone else involved for their generosity in putting on this program. Thank you.